So uh, I am Hussein Shalayan. I am the um, uh, professor here from Moda Classe. And um, it's the first time I'm actually interviewing somebody else. Often I'm the person that's being interviewed. And uh, so it's, my, you know, it's a new experience for me. Um, as you all know, part of our job is to really uh, share with you um, knowledge and insight uh, about uh, our industry. And uh, it's, it's very important for us to bring in experts to share with you their experiences and their lives so you can learn from people that are actually in the fashion industry and uh, their experiences um, and their thoughts on what is happening now. So today we're really lucky to have Sarah Moa. Um, you may know Sarah Moa um, from over the years. Um, she is uh, an MBE, which is this uh, uh, title you get given by the Queen of England, um, which is a very important on, um, honorary title uh, for services in the fashion industry and uh, as a fashion journalist. She is uh, the US uh, chief critic for, um, uh, US Vogue chief critic uh, for Vogue Runway, and she reviews shows, she interviews designers internationally. Uh, whilst working um, on, at the same time, supporting new designers, um, she is, in a way, uh, a sort of advocate for young designers um, working with the British Fashion Council in London. Sarah is um, a very important voice in our industry in the sense that uh, before Sarah, there was never really anybody that would uh, discover young talent and mentor them uh, throughout their careers. So, it's actually, um, you know, in a relatively a new idea. Um, and maybe before Sarah Moa, there was, um, you may have heard of Isabella Blow, who would abstractly discover people and support them, but it was never supported by um, an organization like British Fashion Council. Um, it was very much done on an individual basis. Um, I would say that, um, one of the most, few of the most important people that Sarah has uh, discovered has been uh, people like uh, Christopher Kane, Erdem, uh, J.W. Anderson, Roxander, Peter Pilotto, uh, Simone Rocha, Marquez Almeida, Craig Green, etc. And um, Sarah is also um, chair of the New Gen Committee um, in London, which uh, again, uh, I guess is connected to discovering young talent and nurturing them and sponsoring them, etc. Just to give you a little bit of background before we go into the questions, and we will also open questions uh, to, the, to the public, to, you, to yourselves as well afterwards. Um, so Sarah studied English uh, and History of Arts at, at Leeds University. Uh, she's a visiting professor at Central St. Martins in London. Uh, she's an honorary fellow of the Royal College of Art, honorary doctor at Westminster University, doctor of letters at the Academy of the Arts University, uh, San Francisco. She was, um, as we said, um, uh, also uh, given an MBE um, for her services as a fashion journalist in 2011. So the reason to invite Sarah. As I've known Sarah for nearly 24 years or so, uh, which is really the time that I've been a designer in London. I wasn't a designer that Sarah discovered as such, but Sarah has been part of also my journey in a very, very big way. And, and she's written in our book and um, I've known, how could I put it, like she's been a very strong supporter. Um, and so we're going to, I'm going to start asking a series of questions and it will be organic. And like I said later, you This is role start. reversal, you're saying it's usually me asking oh, you really? questions. Yes, yeah. it is a reversal. <laughs> and I've not been interviewed before on stage. Oh, really? Yeah, because normally Sarah this is, is the first interviewing. <laughs> so um, I think one of the first things to ask you about is, um, like, how did this whole thing come about with you um, 
discovering young designers like the names we mentioned and how did it really, you know, how long ago was it that it started? Well, it was a definite time when I stepped over the line. It used to be that, um, and possibly still is with most, most fashion journalists, you're at a remove and you're a critic and you don't get involved. Um, but there came a, a crisis in, um, in, in British fashion um, around the time that uh, after you slightly established yourself, it was, uh, it was in the late 90s with uh, the same time as Alexander McQueen. Um, I believe it or not, I was quite young myself then. <laughs> um, and um, I, I was still kind of in... Uh, what, what I saw was that, that your generation were leaving London, not necessarily leaving to live, but leaving to show in Paris. And... The British Fashion Council at that stage, I, I would go into people's studios and I, my whole thing as a journalist is I can't bear not to know what's coming next because I think it's most important to find out what the next movements are, what young people are saying. So I would, I would go and see people working in their homes and their, in their studios if they had, the, had them. I knew what their problems were. And um, the British Fashion Council had this thing called the New Gen Sponsorship Committee and all they would do to select was to have a lot of the older generation of journalists and some buyers around this table. And they would have people, not even the designers, just people bringing in, actually girls who worked there, bringing in people, things on hangers. So saying, this is, a, this is, a, this is a, the, the, the designer's clothes. And these people would say yes or no, and they'd be drinking wine at the same time. Um, so nobody knew, nobody knew who the designers were and what their problems were. And I started to get very kind of agitated about this. And I said, look, you've got to have somebody. You've got to hire somebody to go and be a scout. You've got to go because because you're this you're doing a really bad job. And in the end, they said, okay, well, you do it then. <laughs> and so um, you never thought of it as yourself in the beginning. You just thought it had to be done, but you didn't necessarily think it should be you. Because I knew it was an emo no. Because I didn't imagine that I could do that sort of. It's it's a role I made up. Mm. And um, so when, just to kind of tell you, when we talk about the British Fashion Council and these kind of very local terms, like you might think, why are they talking about British Fashion Council? So because this is like the equivalent of the syndicale in Paris. It basically makes all the decisions about what happens in London Fashion Week, who are the designers that show, etc. And in the years that I was a young designer, um, British Fashion Council was a very ineffective institution. Maybe tell us a little bit about how the BFC became a bit more powerful. What was the turning point, you think, where they became a bit more effective and they started to actually help designers? Well, it was when the, the lights were going off in London Fashion Week. And, um, I mean, I, uh, it, it always takes a community to make something happen. Um, it, there was a kind of... Um, I won't say there was a palace coup, but there, uh, there was an amazing woman called Hilary Reaver who, was, who became the, um, she worked on British High Street, uh, became the, the chair person. And it was me, uh, an incredible woman called Jane Shepperson, who was at, uh, the, the brand director at Topshop, who was the sponsor. And Karen Downey, who's somebody who knew about manufacturing. And so I have to say, it was a cabal of us women doing things voluntarily and saying, we're going to change this and make it. But we had this, I didn't dare think we had a vision, but we did one day get together and say every, every single capital has, has to have something special about it. So Milan has the industry, Paris has couture, um, New York has, New York, New York, you know, the mass, mass market and, and uh, um, ready to wear, I suppose. What did London have? Well, London has always had youth um, because we have this... We've had this incredible um, system of art schools, which is a national asset now being eroded. Um, we, it was our ambition to make it the, um, the platform for young emerging talent for Europe, or well, for the world. And we dared say that, and then we kind of made it happen Up over a long time, I have to say. So London does have the youth culture and the pop culture, all of this. But but what, um, what is your feeling about the education system in the UK that you think stands out from the rest of the world and Europe and etc.? Um, I think in Britain there's, there's a culture of individuality. 
Um, I think in Am American um, uh, education, for example, teaches people to be like someone else so that they can go and work in, in a massive industry to make a sweeping generalization. Um, Italy doesn't seem to care because they have family businesses, I mean, historically, and industry. Paris doesn't seem to care because it has it all. <laughs> oh, no, it does care, but no, Paris has organizations that people can stay in for life. So, you know, if you go into LVMH as a kid, you can, you know, you can come out at age 60 with a very nice pension. So, so there hasn't been that entrepreneurial thing. So in, in Britain, uh, we have uh, this combination of art education, individuality, often waves of music, um, and just no rules, really. I don't know. What did you feel when you came to London? Well, I grew up in London. I came Yes, I know, but went, went, to arts, went to art school. Yeah, I, mean. I went to St. Martin's, and before that I did a foundation, etc. Um, but I think that one thing to say about, another thing to say about London, really, is probably that um, uh, once you graduate from uh, London University or UK University, uh, you could be celebrated, but you don't necessarily get jobs in the UK. And often I find that a lot of the British designers are getting jobs outside London. Why do you feel this is happening? That you go to a lot of houses and you meet a lot of... Uh, well, because they're, they're fantastically qualified, I think. Um, I think there's a huge competition between students in a good way, because everybody's an individual and people... Yeah, people compete and the, the bar is set very high and um, also there's a, a culture of, um, of skills as well. Um, and I think people, people know about fashion. They have an idea of what, uh, what the future can be. So I think that kind of creativity is there. But I, I mean, I wouldn't say by any weeping... Uh, um, stretch of the imagination that everybody's British, but I know that you know Calvin Klein. There are loads, I mean, there are British trained designers all over the world. Yeah, and also we don't we don't have big industries apart from Burberry. We don't have big 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 brands in in the UK. Okay, so I'm going to move uh, slowly towards um, how you um, discover designers and how you um, nurture them. So. You know, the obvious question is, what ingredients do you look for in a designer? What do you think is important? Well, as old as I am, <clears throat> I want them to, somebody to surprise me, first of all. Because um, um, in every time there are different circumstances, there are different um, waves of things that matter, different, different, um, different politics. <clears throat> I think I look... I've always seen fashion as a medium for saying things. Um, it's a reflection of society in, in, in real time. <clears throat> That's what I'm really interested in, but I'm also interested in who the individual is. And so does that, is that person articulating something, can be something very micro that they're very good at, or it might be something just very sweeping, or it might be something very connected to their generation. This is one thing I really do look for, is, is are you speaking for yourself and who you know? Um, I'm always quite suspicious. Well, just not... <clears throat> I'm, I, I will, I'll kind of switch off when I see somebody who I think is, is designing a fake collection, what I would say a fake collection, an imaginary collection for a lady or a man out there who's not the person. Because if you're not talking to, you know, if you don't actually believe in your clothes and you don't wear them or you don't, you can't imagine anybody wearing them other than this fantasy lady, um, I, I don't see the future in that. Um, something else I, always look, I also look for is, um, because often I'm, I'm dealing with people who, who really want to have their own labels. Um, and in that circumstance, it's always the family behind them. And I'm not talking about wealthiness of, uh, you know, uh, family at all. I'm talking about who your gang are and um, um, 
are you practical? So, I mean, Christopher Kane had, had his sister Tammy, Erdem has his sister Sarah, and his boyfriend he met at uh, the RCA, a whole co cohort to come up together. Um, J. W. Anderson has his brother in his business. Um, it's not that I don't think that you can't be a genius on your own, but if in fashion, it's a, as you know, it's a very, very practical thing. You have to have people with other skills around. So maybe it's a granny who can knit, or it's a mother who does the books, or a, a, a father, sorry, this is very sexist now, who can build the set. <laughs> uh, the sister who can build the set. Literally, um, I've seen that in, in, in so many, including Helmut Lang, who had a whole, whole gang around him who got on the bus from uh, Vienna and drove to Paris to show in the first place. And talking about, uh, let's say, um, designers who, you said you have a lot of designers around you that want to do their own brands. How about other skills in fashion? How about other ways of succeeding in fashion apart from just being a designer? And what are your thoughts on this? Like, well, I, uh, this is, uh, my thoughts are uh, when people jump up in front of me and say, I've just graduated, I want time to dine to them. What am I? I say, don't. <laughs> I say, go and work for somebody. And if you really can't put them off, then perhaps I'll, 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 I'll help them. Um, um, my thoughts are that there are far too many fashion students, fashion design students educated, I and mean, it's a problem in our country. I can't even imagine how many thousands there are. Be, I'd be scared to count, um, let alone across Europe and the world. Um, the trouble is that I think that careers in fashion are not vi visible enough. Fashion industry doesn't do enough a good job to show now where the skills gaps are. So in pattern cutting, in merchandising, in production, in ev everything to do with e-commerce, that's massive. <clears throat> people who, you know, having people who can manage your, um, your own um, e-commerce e um, uh, business is something that a d designer can, can, can need, really needs, an independent designer. Um, and, uh, you know, there's this whole spectrum of jobs. So, and, there's, and then there's PR, there's people who, 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 if you're really good at selling something, and you're enthusiastic and you can make friends for a designer, that's a job, that's a massively important job. Um, and then there's, you know, photography, film make, video making now. Styling. Styling. Tom did Styling. Katie, Katie Grand was a fashion student in my year. Was she? she became, yes, and she became... <clears throat> Apparently she did knitwear, yes. yes. <laughs> Failed at that, but look at her now. <laughs> yes. She used to knit everywhere, like yeah. those people on the tube, they, she would knit even, you know, while we would have lunch. Yeah. And um, I wanted to ask you also about um, designers who are not so talented, but who are good communicators and who are good at working with other designers who are talented. This is a very important well, point. Well, I, I think they are talented, you no. say, and they're just different, <laughs> differently no. talented. They're, just, uh, they, they're, they're talented in a way that um, yes. is, is kind of super talent. important yes. now. Yeah. But it's about the designer who isn't talented creatively, but talented in terms of knowing another talent that they can work <clears> with. Well, this is the I don't think you can manufacture these things. I, 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 I agree. I, I, I believe in movements and friendship groups yeah. and people helping one another. So. The people who I know is, who are successful now I met all their all their people, their gang at college, <clears throat> and you grow up with them. Um, so um, that happened to you, right? No, you're more on your I didn't own. Really have a business. I didn't no, really have a gang. Like, I built my gang. Yes, well, exactly. Yes, but yeah. uh, yes, definitely. Like you said, they were different. Everyone had different roles, and they were happy mm. to be in that role and to be part of something mm. and to build a brand. Definitely. Mm. Um, but I think my my question, I guess, is that you can develop your skills in various ways. So you could be a leader, you could be a good communicator, and you can still succeed as a brand without you knowing even how to draw. And this is the thing, that this is another kind of skill uh, we're talking about. Mm -hmm. And this is becoming, I guess, another way of working. That it's not necessarily you drawing, you draping, but you being the face of the brand, but you have other designers that work for you. And this can happen also to a younger generation of people, not only someone who is older. 
Uh, so this was the point, I guess. Um, and then, so uh, moving on to um, how you, you know, select your designers and how you uh, look after them and work with them, you probably become a bit of a family with them in a way. Mm. Um, how, I mean, in a way, I think one thing that I heard some people say is that they have ideas, they're skilled, but they are not good networkers, and they're not good. They're quite. They're not good socially. They're shy, or they don't like going out. How do you feel about this? What's What's important in your, What's important? Uh, how is it for you when you hear about a designer? That's well, I don't. Social? I've never met anybody at par a party that I'm. <laughs> yeah. I, 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 that's not the way I find there people. Are designers that, no, no. There are designers that say that they are not good at networking. They're not good at going out. They're not good socially. Well, everybody, everybody can do Instra Instagram. That's all, that's all completely changed now. So you think it's digital media's answer? Well, I do find a lot of people on social media. Yes, I found, I found designers in Iran, in Georgia, um, mm -hmm. all over the you know, places. That, that all over the, the place, yes. And I mean, that's, that's, what I, that's what I want to do now. I mean, I, I, I don't see myself as... <coughs> Um, I was stero I, 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 I kept Africa, I found, found uh, some uh, yeah. guys in uh, Johannesburg, which is so exciting, and Nigeria. Um, I see fashion as um, you have to look at, you can't just keep looking in one place because there's always something else happening over there. And, and now Instagram yeah. widens out your field so, uh, so incredibly, uh, in, in extraordinary ways. And, and you know, every everybody who's talented visually can do can do a great Instagram. That's that's the way to connect. And I must say, I mean, <clears throat> I since we we've also had another every, every time you think that something's going okay, something else goes wrong in in life. And uh, the British government brought in um, very high fees recently. So so we started an education foundation for scholarships. And uh, <clears throat> it's not just me, but <clears throat> I have a panel of people who um, uh, interview people pre-BA. And now, I must say, you do check out people's Instagrams and what's on them. So <laughs> you need to be, I'd have to tell you, you've all got very professional Instagrams, I'm sure. 